We must recognize that on many problems of great interest, there is no common meeting of minds. There are so many things to learn, and so little is actually known. And yet, from very long ago, men really tried to be thoughtful. And perhaps it is a mistake on our part to assume that all the world's best thinking has been done in recent years. We have a tendency to believe that fact began with the development of a scientific method for the accumulation and evaluation of knowledge. It is true that facts have become very important to us, but so much that we want to know is outside of the boundaries of any machinery that we can set up for the evaluation of human thought. I have always believed that someday we will acknowledge reason to be a valid source of facts. That which is reasonable, truly reasonable, must come very close to the truth itself. And in many areas where facts cannot penetrate, or the factual instincts cannot operate, we have the power of reason. And this has done a great deal to enrich our lives, to make our concepts more noble, our ideals more luminous, than they would otherwise be in the face of the available facts. The study of man began when man first began to be aware of himself and others. There are some very interesting forms of knowledge about man preserved by primitive people we have begun to realize that primitive people could have a valid kind of knowledge, a folk knowledge, something that arises in the inner consciousness of the individual and carries on down through. Nearly all great cultures, civilizations, have produced philosophers of one kind or another, and the philosophers were the scientists of antiquity. Furthermore, there had come down to us a wonderful heritage of ancient legendary, myths of a golden age, fables, folklore. We are not able to fully trace all of these streams of belief, but there is a suspicion that it may sometime be proven that mythology is the history of the prehistoric world of things, that it is only prehistory, veiled in the emotionalizations of later peoples, but still containing much that is valid, much that is essentially true, if we have patience enough and liberality of mind enough to contemplate this rich storehouse without sophistication. The Hindus, Chinese, Egyptians, Greeks, Persians, all developed elaborate theories concerning the origin of man. Even some less cultured nations on our own Western Hemisphere, especially the Maya, the Aztec, and the Inca, gave a lot of thought to this mystery. After all, man lives with himself. He faces himself every day. 
He learns a little about the lore of his own people. And with the coming of history, a magnificent pageantry was open to him. We cannot blame him if he speculates. He tries to think through the mystery of himself. He tries to determine in some way where he came from, and why he is here, and where he is going. Nearly all of the older nations of the world assume that man existed for a very long time. In India, for example, long before the rise of modern science, or the more recent discoveries relating to human remains, the Hindus were already thinking of an earth inhabited by something at least resembling man 20, 30, 50, 100 million years ago. They knew whatever this process was that produced man was not rapid. They realized also that the gradual evolutionary processes which brought man into being were in a way recapitulated by the prenatal cycle in man's present coming into birth. Just as surely as the embryo passes through many stages of development, more or less summarizing the whole evolution of the animal kingdom, so it is evident that man himself came forth a very long time ago, that he was not instantaneously or wonderfully produced. There was not a case of a world without a man, and then marvelously saying, man was there. He did not appear uh, with his girdle of fig leaves, as most often represented in masterpieces of the 15th and 16th centuries. Nor did man arise, as in most of old paintings, clean-shaven and well-groomed. There was something else to this picture. Man had to grow up. Most ancient peoples were convinced that man came out of water. They believed that he some way came out of an ocean, or out of a great depth or deepness. We're beginning to suspect this ourselves, even now. But man, according to the most ancient tradition, was a fish that came forth upon the land. And gradually his gills disappeared, gradually his fins vanished, little by little he assumed the proportions that we now know. Not necessarily because these proportions were destined for him, but because there was a kind of something inside of man that began to fashion instruments for the expression of this inner self. And the shape and appearance of man was due to the urgencies within his own nature, which caused him to externalize the means of accomplishing the purposes that his dawning consciousness began to comprehend. Also, it was assumed that the problem of man had something to do with the animal kingdom. Man is now generally regarded as a mammal. Uh, some rather optimistically hold that he is the highest of the mammals. Others are not so sure. He is certainly the most precocious. But in any way you wish to look at it, there's something that the ancient did not quite understand. It didn't quite meet his thinking. But somewhere, for no reason that anyone could comprehend, one small strain of mammals suddenly began to excel and to specialize until this strain produced man. But left behind man, all the rest of the animal world, untouched, perhaps uncontaminated by this process of sudden growth. You can't really answer the question, why did one kind of animal keep on evolving and become man, and another kind of animal did not keep on evolving and become man. 
We pass over this rather lightly at the moment. It is an inconvenient question. But our ancient friends thought about it. It seemed to them that there had to be a real answer. That there was something about man that was not just animal plus. Uh, that some way man had different endowments so completely that even now, after millions of additional years for evolution have taken place or have passed, these other kingdoms do not seem to be seriously encroaching upon man. Well, they are encroaching in a way, but not by aping him, not by becoming like him. And sometime long ago, a part of animals became man. The miracle has not been repeated. Is there a reason why it has not been repeated? Some of our older thinkers began to contemplate as to what it is in which man differs from the animal. And perhaps a mother knows better than anything anyone else can something that happens to the child as yet unborn within her body, the quickening. In some way, this body suddenly comes to life. Something seems to take hold of it. And from that time on, in a strange, wonderful way, that body becomes a living being. And from that time on, that body's destiny is determined by this mysterious, intangible, sudden coming of aliveness which causes this little inanimate thing to start striking out, preparing itself to be born. The Hindus like to suspect that somewhere in the evolution of the animal kingdom, something happened that resembles a quickening. Suddenly, a part of the animal world was ensouled. Something was bestowed upon it. Something happened. And in this mystery or miracle, a new value was added that was not just the product of evolution. That this something that was added took hold of a potential mental nervous structure and enriched it with a potential not anywhere else found among natural things. This potential immediately began to strike out with its own aliveness. And suddenly, what may have appeared physically to be an animal, suddenly was no longer an animal. The quickening does not necessarily immediately change the appearance of an embryo. But slowly, its destiny is changed. It is, its destiny is changed by the fact that it is ensouled by something. This was the belief also of some of the early Jewish mystics, the Kabbalists especially. We find traces of it in the apocalyptical book of Enoch. For in this book, it was declared that at a very remote time, angels called the sons of God descended from heaven upon a mighty mountain and gazing down looked upon the daughters of men and came unto them. And from this union was born a race of giants. Perhaps this has an allegory to it that is important. The sons of God, this was a good name for that mysterious thing that quickens. And the daughters of men could be a good name for this body which is quickened. Perhaps, therefore, what the Hindus and the old Kabbalist mystics, the Babylonians and the Assyrians, sought to tell us in their own way was that some kind of a superior order of life from another place, from another condition or dimension of being descended into the bodies of some animals 
animals of a kind or type, particularly serviceable for this purpose. Nature produced by its striving many kinds of animals. These are described so clearly in the Phoenician history of Sankranathon. These monsters of old days gradually vanished away into the void of things. Nature, struggling in the alchemical laboratory of the dawn of time, brought forth creatures, brought forth a world as the home of these creatures. And here, long before the light of our reason was shed upon the world, these creatures blindly, dumbly, numbly, stumbled through the mysteries of the prehistoric fen. Many of them vanished in the terrible upheavals of volcanic and seismic disturbances. Uncounted millions probably perished in the vast sweep of the glacial periods. But nature, ever trying to create an enduring type, gradually climaxed the animal evolution. By a kind of animal, it may have been not too different from an anthropoid. An animal which had gone as far as beast could go. We see around us today many forms of animals, birds, insects. They're not all alike. They're not all equal as possible potential vehicles for further growth. But there was some time long ago among all animals the best of animals. These are the ones that seem to have been ensouled. These are the ones that seem to have received this quickening. So the ancient Vedas uh, try to, tries to tell us where these beings came from. They did not come from far away. They came some way from the inner structure of nature itself. As we mentioned last week, there was not only a visible world and a subterranean sphere of magnetic and electric forces, but there was an atmosphere, a mysterious band of energy which enclosed the earth itself, a magnetic field or aura extending out from the body of the earth. And this was stratified into various levels of vibration, energy, and quality. And in these various stratifications, according to the ancients, were lives waiting to be born. These lives were born out of the planetary life itself. These lives became, and, became embodied as forms developed to receive them. The first of these invisible lives to be informed was the mineral. And as crystallization became uh, more advanced, the surface of the earth becoming capable of sustaining some form of life against the horrible combustions of the period of preformations. As this material substance increased in solidity, a wave of energies, of life principles, were supposed to have ensouled minerals. Now, the peculiar destiny of these ensoulments were, uh, ensoulments was, that this type of ensoulment had to last for the entire duration of the Earth's existence. Once these souls were locked within the minerals, they could not escape until the mineral kingdom itself was dissolved back into the compounds from which it came. Therefore, sleeping locked within some kind of a strange darkness were orders of life, which, however, had the mysterious power to reveal themselves magnetically, reveal themselves in the strange vibratory patterns of minerals and metals reveal themselves through the wonderful colorations of metallic and mineral chemistries and also in the fissions and crystallizations 
and the various lines of cleavage, which reveal that minerals, particularly crystals, are all mathematical patterns. Later, from this condition, from the dark earth of the crystal embodiment itself, the material form of things, that gradually began as mosses and lichen, the beginnings of vegetable life. A life which began, according to the Greeks, in decay, in the green scum upon the surface of things. The Platonists believed that water received into itself free spores that floated in space, and that these free lives, captured and drawn within the magnetic field of the earth, fell into water, where a strange decomposition took place, a death. And out of this death and decay, life came. Life as a green scum upon the surface of water. This was the ilium, the illus, the mysterious source of the family of the Trojans in Greek mythology. When this vegetable kingdom had reached a certain degree of development, lives from the atmosphere of the Earth's outer surface descended into these forms, quickened them, and the true development of mineral li uh, vegetable life began. This vegetable life had considerably more freedom of expression than that of the mineral. Yet some of these vegetable forms also lasted a great time, like the sequoia trees and the cryptomeria of Japan, trees that might grow and live and linger for 10,000 years, trees that were old long before the wars of Troy and the fall of the ancient solar race of India. Later, from this same type of continual growth, uh, these plants began to extend further powers. One of the things that seems to have had a strange and little appreciated influence on all this was that plants gradually developed horizontal structures. From the slender, vertical stem of the ancient tree came the far more complicated form of the bush and the shrub, the vine and the tendrils. Perhaps this is why the grape was so highly venerated among ancient peoples, for they believed uh, that when plants developed horizontal spines or horizontal stems, they began to verge toward the animal. Because in that kingdom, the magnetic field operates through the horizontal spine. But in any event, some plants seem to have gradually evolved until they could be quickened into animals. And so it went on, until finally some animals reached a point where mysterious beings or entities held in the outer magnetic atmosphere of the earth the spores of humanity were able to take upon themselves these bodies. And in the course of time, the pressure of the peculiar consciousness which we call man broke through. The animals ceased to be like other animals and gradually became lord of the rest, binding to its use those lives not quickened by its own unique mental potential. Various estimates were made as to when this all might have happened. Perhaps the most conservative figures would put it somewhere between 30 and 50 million years ago. It might have been a billion years. Probably not so long, however. But somewhere, when time was right, the unfolding planet, with all that it carried with it, fulfill some destiny locked within its own archetype or purpose. For it began to release in itself, through itself, and from itself, the kingdoms that were to people it, that were to give it its covering, its adornments, 
And these adornments of these peoples gradually became the reason for the planet itself. It was their mother. It fed them all. It gave them form and birth, and finally in death received them back again into its own dark earth. Once it is assumed that man was a creature which had a unique destiny bestowed upon it as part of its evolution, then we can begin to understand why man changed the course of nature and little by little uh, gained a strange independence. Man became the only animal that could really worry. I, there are tendencies now for animals to be neurotic, but it is assumed to be as a result of association with man, which is enough to make anything neurotic. But uh, man certainly is the only animal that knows that it must die. It is the only animal which has ambitions, as we know them. It is the only animal that can pray and hope and argue. It is the only animal that can force its will upon a vast pattern of things by some premeditation, preconception of its own. And it is the only animal that has ever been impelled to ravage the planet. This, however, is not the major purpose of human destiny. In some mysterious way, this body, which we call human, is still unfolding. Having obtained a certain mathematical shape, a certain proportion, the evolution of man produced the body and its changes up to a point. And then apparently the body had completed that which its evolution required of it. The body of man will continue to be modified gradually over vast periods of time. But as far as we can tell, it has remained about the same for a very long time. The body of man has not changed as rapidly in recent times. And evolution has moved from the growth of the body to the growth of the person within the body. Unless the person grows, the evolution of the body is meaningless as far as man is concerned. For the body is now dedicated to the advancement of his purpose. If man needs more from the body, the body in time will provide it. If man demands faculties or powers which he does not at present possess, nature will meet this demand and body will be modified to produce whatever is needed. But for some time it has appeared that man does not need to make any major renovation in his physical structure. It is also rather obvious that for some time man has not called upon the resources he already possesses is not demanding of the body the full measure of its loyalty or its obedience. He is simply acting as a, a despot, requiring that the body sustain his follies, whatever they may be. For this reason, the body is punished, and its security and survival are endangered. If the person in the body fails the body, then ultimately this entire form will fall back into the chaos from which it came in some remote uh, period of the past. The person in the body, however, continues to grow. We observe, historically, a tremendous unfoldment of man. We notice the rise of arts and sciences, the increase of knowledge. We also perceive in him the unfoldment of his aesthetic sensibilities his ideals, his dreams, his imagination. Little by little, a man has raised himself to the highest level of creativity which he is capable of conceiving. Not too high, perhaps, but the best he can do. So 
So man continues in one way or another to reach out from within himself through education, through arts, through religion and philosophy uh, to gain greater and greater maturity of consciousness uh, which must come if the purpose for which man was created is to be attained. In the process of his evolution, man also developed a pattern of racial differentiations, very similar to the animal species of other kingdoms, or the types of plants or minerals that we find. Man, however, being a little more self-centered, a little more egotistic than most other creations, no longer considered variety as something gracious and enchanting. He began to think of variety only in terms of competitive excellence. Therefore, instead of, un of recognizing the unfolding of humanity as a magnificent mystery of life, he began to stigmatize the various kinds of his own type. He began to talk about advanced races and backward races. He created a vast conflict in races, uh, simply because he did not realize that racial differentiation in the human kingdom is like the differentiation in, of birds or of flowers or of the bright minerals in the earth. Men treasure some minerals more than others, but the minerals themselves are equal. There is no difference in their value apart from that which we artificially put upon them. Thus all forms of humanity have meaning, have purpose, and are subjected to laws of evolution. Uh, some have had greater opportunity. Some have been more fortunate in climatic environment, which has a very big bearing upon growth. But all humanity is one living thing, under one archetype. And this archetype is bringing humanity gradually into a maturity of purpose suitable to its destiny. But we are not too sure just where we are in this unfolding cycle of things. But the Oriental peoples especially, the Chinese and the Hindus, consider that humanity has passed the halfway mark in its development. In the course of the involutionary process, life, consciousness, intelligence, descended gradually into the organisms which it was to ensoul, which the different qualities were to ensoul. And then having reached the midway point in growth, the involutionary process tipped into an evolutionary one. That which had gradually been locked into body began to break through body. And little by little in the evolutionary cycle, man will release into manifestation all of the potentials uh, which were gradually locked into him in the process of quickening a body. The evolutionary trend therefore means that man's growth from now on through the rest of the pattern of humanity is a continual revelation from within himself of that which is within himself. And this means that much that we know nothing about today must ultimately come forth from him. Today we are a little concerned over things like extrasensory perception. We are beginning to suspect that there are powers in man that have not yet been generally appreciated. We are aware that clairvoyance may exist and not be merely a superstition of old times. That various forms of pre-knowledge and foreknowledge may also exist. That psychometry may be real. That it is quite possible that man has energies which have not yet revealed themselves, that powers to heal his own sickness, powers to overcome his own ignorance, may, lock, may be locked within him. The Chinese have always believed that sometime man would release through himself the power to educate himself, 
and that it would not be necessary for him to, to build vast educational systems. These educational systems are only there to prod the sleep, sleeping knowledge in man. For education itself, from the word educo, means only to draw forth. It does not mean to cram in. <laughs> so that it's quite possible that there may be a mysterious power by, may, by which man can tune into knowledge. Just as today he is able to twist the dials on a television or a radio and achieve a miracle that his ancestors would have regarded as not the work of God, but the work of the devil with fair cause. In any event, man has more in him than has ever come out. And the process of bringing it out and getting it out is associated with the situation of living. And here we can begin to think in terms uh, of some of the other Eastern moral philosophies concerning man. Buddhism has quite a lot to say about this, because after all its peculiar province was man and the internal structure of his own psychic nature. Obviously, man grows best under pressure of some kind. The individual uh, must be lured out of a kind of complacency which might otherwise uh, reduce his probabilities of survival. All the way down through the kingdoms of nature to the lowest that we can understand, the great pressure to survive has moved all things forward. Survival means always that the individual must be more than he is or perish. That which he is sets up problems for him. The present level of his knowledge at any time causes him to endanger himself. The only solution seems to be that as this danger becomes more immediate and imminent, the human being has to release another level of insight to combat this situation in which he has painted himself into a corner. Each time he uses this insight, he moves forward. Then he rests for a little while and uses his new level of insight to get himself into a further difficulty. This again has to be solved by another exertion of consciousness so that man grows simply because he wants to survive. He has never grown really from the sheer joy of the prospect. He has never become wise, become wise so much from the fact that he loved wisdom as that he was tired of misery. And out of wisdom he hoped to find a remedy for misery. Thus, something prods us, has prodded us from the beginning, and has forbidden us any security since man was man. At a very early time, when he hardly knew enough to survive, he had already sufficient skill to tie a stone to an axe handle and hit his brother over the head with it. From the oldest days, he was in conflict with his own kind. Ambitions and jealousies began to develop within him. Conspiracy became one of his greatest uh, avocations. He was resolved to conquer the earth as soon as he knew that there was an earth. So little by little he has complicated his destiny. He has created systems and destroyed them. He has built cities and torn them down. He has made laws and broken them. He has persecuted others and been persecuted in turn. He has become more dangerous with the passing of every year until now his own dangerousness really frightens him almost out of his wits. Man goes on, forever trying to find the answer. <clears throat> so what we call suffering, or what Buddhism calls suffering, is the natural and inevitable consequence of man living contrary to a reasonable code. 
Suffering arises from breaking the simple rules, or, as the scriptures would insist, from disobedience. Not disobedience to a personal deity, but disobedience to the general pattern of existence itself. Disobedience to the common sense rules, which have always been, which man has always to a measure at least, recognized. But because of his own nature, because of his own arrogance, because of his own incredible ambitions and determinations, man has forced his way down through time, almost always destroying something. Against this destruction, he has tried to build certain laws, rules, institutions, the Hague Conferences, the League of Nations, the United Nations Organization, all these represent man's recognition of his own inability to govern himself with dignity. And yet the same old struggle goes on. Buddhism simply takes the attitude that all this is contributing to evolution simply because it is forcing the individual to wake up that ultimately he will reach a condition in which he must be right or perish. And when that time comes, at least a percentage will choose to be right. This would then carry this mysterious process of growth over the next hurdle which lies in the future. The next point that perhaps is of value in the study of man is the consideration of his destiny. Where is man going? This, of course, depends largely upon the basic thinking. If you're an existentialist, man isn't going very far. And if you are a humanist, he may not make it even as far as the existentialist. If you're a Christian humanist, you have a slight confusion in your mind, but you have greater hopes. Actually, where a man is going depends very largely upon trying to decide in your own mind whether anything is going anywhere. If you want to assume when you look out of a window that there is nothing there except accident, incident, circumstance, Conditions that have no rational foundation in anything. That the universe simply exists. And it does not know why itself and never will discover. That there was nothing that fashioned it. It has always been, or if it hasn't always been, it arose by some spontaneous process within itself. For a long time, science had the delightful hypothesis that the universe is the only machine in the world that could manufacture itself in the first place. This was considered scientific. We rather doubt that at the moment. We also have to say, is man going anywhere? Is there any relationship between modern man and ancient man? Are the Greeks and the Romans gone forever? If so, what good were the Greeks and Romans? Tourist agencies will tell us they left some splendid ruins which have been exploited with considerable profit by travel agencies. But what of the experience of the Greeks and Romans? Do we know really anything about it? Did they ever leave any adequate histories? Uh, did they ever tell the truth about themselves and did anyone else ever tell the truth about them? We do not know. We know that in some mysterious way, the mistakes of the Greeks and Romans linger on. What about the, uh, the tremendous but dismal periods of the Dark Ages? Here man went through some of the most extraordinary examples of self-delusion that have ever been recorded. Here men frightened themselves to death. Witchcraft, demonology the individual living in a universe of terrors, believing in a good God and finding nothing good anywhere. 
Many went out to save the world by the Crusades. The Crusades were probably the greatest disaster in Western history. Nothing happened. And while the Crusaders were out trying to save the Holy Land, uh, the four Fs who remained behind took over Europe. <laughs> this was perhaps the way it should have been, but it was not exactly inspiring. What about all this? Does it mean anything? What about the magnificent cultures of China and India of ancient times? The caves of Elora and Elephanta? The wonderful sculpturings of Sarnath and Benares? The beautiful monuments of the, Mo of the Mughal Empire? What are all these things? Do they mean anything? The builders of them are gone. Is man only able to leave behind him monuments to his own dead? Are the builders of these things gone forever? And will we, who now stand in wonder of these monuments, join the forever dead in our own turn? This is something that, somewhere along the line, Western man is going to have to solve. Because if he doesn't solve it, he's going to end in the most complete neurosis. The individual simply can't live with absolute nihilism. He cannot build anything if there is nothing to build with and nothing to survive after it is built. So, man today is gravely concerned with not only where he is going, but if he is going. And yet, it would seem a, a very tragic thing indeed if this wonderful generation should perish completely. We're not so sure we like this generation in every way. But you realize that a hundred years from now there will probably be not a handful of human beings alive who are alive today. Everything will have gone. New generations will take over. The process is so gradual we hardly notice it. But it is inevitable and eternal. And so, if evolution is going to take place, how does it operate? Biologically? Are we to assume that in some mysterious way all the growth we have achieved goes on in the cell? And then some way or other, the future is enriched by the fact that we have existed. The future doesn't know this any more than we know how much we were enriched by the past. But is it all there? And if so, is there sufficient justification in this? Is it perfectly all right that everything shall perish, only that the genes can go on? It doesn't sound economical, it doesn't sound especially reasonable, but it is frightfully scientific. In fact, it is frightful. But we have no, we have no way uh, to refute the scientist in his own language. We can only profoundly suspect that he is short-sighted. In this way, let us then take the possibility which also belong to our ancient brethren, that this life moving down through time is one life. That humanity is one way of life. That that which is actually growing is like the flowing of a river. That life is moving from its source to its final state as one vast organism that this motion is real, that this motion is purposeful, that these things happen because it is best that they happen, and that some force, power, or plan that we do not understand has decreed that the only way in which the particular purpose now at hand can be accomplished is the way it is being accomplished, and that therefore this way is indeed the beautiful necessity. It is the thing as it should be, as it must be. 
Man can only hope, however, to try to fathom something of the mystery of it, to find out how to explain his place in this project. Buddha was very suspicious that man would ever be able to know, as a mental fact, the truth about himself. Buddha realized that the mind is the slayer of the real, that the mind locks us in attitudes, but that this is strange but true, that the mind is a blind man that thinks it can see. The mind has created in its own darkness a kind of inner sight, a sight which is simply devoted to seeing what is expected, what is required, what is assumed to be true. The mind is locked within the kind of a pattern that produces college professors, intelligentsia and historians generally and produces the endless perpetuation of policies that are defended long after their vitality is exhausted. The mind just keeps on thinking in the same old way. And the individual cannot grow his own mind. He can be more honest than his religion, he can be more enlightened than his education, and he can be more scientific than his sciences. Because these are heavy things, moving slowly, but man moves more rapidly and anticipates in himself the courses which institutions will follow in ages to come. So we have the possibility that man has other ways of finding out the facts. If man wants to know about himself in the Buddhist philosophy, the only answer is to disentangle his mind from its attachments to all the preconceptions, restrictions, and limitations imposed by tradition and the common observation of things around him. This does not mean that the individual is to allow his mind to wander about like an, an unbroken colt in a pasture. But it does take the ground that the deepest part of human knowledge, that part of the individual which can come the nearest to knowing, is something very silent, uh, very abstract within the core of man's own being. The only way the individual can hope to know is through inner experience. The only solution lies in an unconditioned intuition. Not an intuition that is waiting to see a certain thing. Not an intuition that decides beforehand what it is going to discover. Not an intuition that is going to censor its own processes by conventional rules. Not an intuition that would be afraid of idealism or afraid of realism, but an intuition receptive to whatever is actually there. even though what is there may bear no resemblance to our expectancy. Consequently, Buddhism takes the position that if the individual can release his faculties from their addiction to prevailing opinions, can save himself entirely from that opinionism which Heraclitus called the falling sickness of the reason, that it is possible by the most profound internalization in a condition which we might term abstract meditation, for the individual to have a glimpse 
of at least the shadows of reality, that it is conceivable that the person can have a clear impression from the universe of the universal purpose itself, that it can be true and proper, that within man there are some superior faculties which cannot know all things, but which can extend the boundaries of internal knowledge nearer to cause than any processes that we can use intellectually, rationally, or scientifically. Therefore, that instead of thinking about the universe, or thinking up a solution for the universe, there is a condition or situation in which the universe can impose its own condition upon man. The universe can define itself, not in words, not necessarily even in symbols, but simply in impact. That the great mystery of life produced man. Therefore, man is bound to that mystery. He is in rapport with it in some way, whether he knows it or not. And that which produced him can reach him, can in some way bestow itself upon him if he does not interfere with the transmission. Meditation is consequently uh, the achievement of a receptivity by which the individual can intuit that which he cannot intellectually comprehend. Out of this can come a tremendous, unchanging resolution of acceptance of life itself. The individual, as in uh, the case described by Havelock Ellis and he, as to his own experience in the dance of life, the individual can have something that happens to him by means of which all doubt, all uncertainty, all question simply ceases. It is not that the questions are answered, but by some mysterious power the questions are no longer important. Something transcends all question with certainty. Something transcends all doubt with a tremendous capacity for a dynamic acceptance. In some way, perhaps, this is man's nearest approach to deity. And according to the Tibetans and others, there is a moment in the transition of the human being from this world to wherever he is going, the moment of death. In that moment, there is this mystical experience. In the moment of transition, the individual has this flashing acceptance, has this strange, incredible realization that he is entering into a reality rather than a vacuum, that some way where he is going and how he is going to get there is these are no longer important. There is a tremendous sense of a complete rightness, a tremendous overwhelming sense of security, which seems to come only uh, when man has reached the final end of his insecurity in this world. This is perhaps why the Buddhists insist that the nirvanic experience at the end of the evolutionary process of man, the achievement of the transcendent consciousness in which the individual is no longer conditioned, uh, the condition itself being suspended or transfigured by something else, 
that in the moment of this nirvana, and in this moment only, uh, the Buddha achieving enlightenment becomes fully aware of the measure of enlightenment. Again, perhaps, not knowing the answers to all the questions, but reaching a state in which there is no longer any inclination to ask the questions, because a supreme fitness, a supreme sufficiency, moves in upon the individual and quiets forever all of his doubts regarding providence. Some way, this is supposed to be the end of all human evolution. But man shall come into an accord with truth. Not that man shall possess it, but more correctly, possibly, truth shall possess man. Evolution is the releasing of these faculties, perceptions, and means by means of which the individual can escape legitimately from the mysterious cycles of embodiment in which he is at this time so completely imprisoned. Paracelsus von Hohenheim, the great Swiss physician and mystic, then began to study the body of man rather attentively. It is astonishing that a people for the most part, prohibiting dissection, and therefore with very little scientific knowledge of the internal workings of the human body, should have accomplished so much in scientific uh, research as far as anatomy and physiology is, are concerned as the Grecians. It is astonishing that they gained so much. The clinics of Hippocrates of Kos were clinics of observation. Uh, they were based upon a kind of intuitive study of man. And the Asclepiads of Greece uh, de developed an intuitive theory of diagnosis and treatment. We know this. We also realize that to them this was the proper function of the priest physician. The uh, priests of the healing God used this internal intuition, cultivated by prayer, by disciplines and meditations, perhaps mostly by consecration to the needs of the sick. This intuition became their guide to the treatment of disease. And in spite of how we may feel about it, they did astonishingly well. So did the Chinese. Uh, the Yellow Emperor's Book of Medicine is a very learned work. Learned because it is a book on anatomy and physiology developed by rationalization alone and without practically any clinical or dissectional knowledge. It might be termed an empiric system. It was simply achieved by imposing the universe upon man and assuming that man was a miniature of the world and treating him in this way so that all methods of treatment were based upon astronomy and sidereal motion. That actually sickness and health were cosmic mysteries related to the sun and moon and to the motions of the stars. This did not follow uh, that the uh, Yellow Emperor's Book of Medicine was an astronomical or astrological thesis. This is not the fact. The fact is, however, that it did recognize that the human being was a little universe and that therefore all the principles that men could study in nature were applicable to man. The Druids of Britain developed the theory that there was a plant in the earth for every star in the sky. And that just as the combinations of stars 
from diagnostic patterns. So the herbs of the earth, when combined, constituted the perfect remedies for all ailments. One of the old Druids said that there is not a sickness of the flesh, but that there is a flower or a plant or a shrub which is its proper, proper remedy, and that you may not have too much difficulty in discovering it. The leaves, the roots, the buds, the fruit, the plants themselves have some mysterious resemblance to the ailment for which they are the cure. It is only a matter of skillful observation to discover the right ones. We no longer think this through, but most of the old Druid and Paracelsian remedies that were developed, and many of those developed in China and India and Egypt, are now in the modern pharmacopoeia. We no longer are told where they came from because actually they came from people who gained their knowledge through dreams and visions and magic. And these are not considered solid foundations. The only disconcerting factor is that the remedies work. The same is true of your American Indian medicine priest. I have talked with several and years ago brought one here to Los Angeles to live with me. He told how he was called by the gods of healing, how he went out into the desert at night and prayed. And as he walked along in the night, he asked the old ones and the true ones to give him the remedies for the sicknesses of his people. And as he prayed and walked, he would say, this old Indian, who is very good, is very sick. He has great pains and misery. He has asked me uh, to bring medicine to him. I am the medicine priest. I must find the remedy. So he would go out and walk in the night. And he told me, he said, as I was walking along, praying and asking, he said, I saw a little glow form around a weed. This weed suddenly shone like a little star. And I, that was it. So we took the little weed and made a tea of it, brewed it, gave it to the sick man, and the sick man recovered. He said all of his remedies came the same way. They came from dreams or visions or little lights around the plants at night when he wandered out to pray and ask the help of the old ones and the true ones who had gone before. This is the way science began. Sometimes we wish it had remained so sensitive to the intuitive mysteries of life. So Paracelsus pointed out that there is within man another universe, a universe of powers, a universe of principles that within the human being are the remedies for the ailments of his life. Paracelsus said, the Creator has given man three books, by the reading of which he could perfect his knowledge. The first is the universe. The second is Holy Writ. And the third is the human body. From, the, from these, duly and properly studied, all can be found that is necessary. But to duly and properly study these, man must be quiet, reverent, humble. He must ask for help. He must ask for the light to shine around the little weed. He must believe that it will shine. So great learning spends millions and men still die. We are not willing yet to pray for light, to ask humbly that the eternal physician be revealed in the works of nature. Also in India, of course, the human body becomes closely associated with the great mysteries of yoga, Vedanta, and Tantra. 
The human body becomes an alchemical mystery, like that of the medieval scientists. Man develops within himself the secret science of his own salvation. He becomes capable of regulating his own body. He gains control over the functions and processes of his own flesh. Little by little, he attains a benevolent mastery of the very body which has been so uncertain and difficult to control. The yoga systems prove conclusively that we can control pain, that we can stimulate and regulate the functions of organs and structures, that we are capable of maintaining this body by an act of will. And among the ancient beliefs there was one to this effect, that as man achieves his highest evolutionary procedure, he will become capable of the voluntary control, structure, and repair of his own body. That in himself he is the physician. And that in evolution, this power to heal himself will come out of him just as the power to instruct himself arises in his own nature. In the Shingon Shu, the tantric sect of Japanese Buddhists, Dainichi Nyori, seated in the center of a lotus of eight scarlet petals, represents the eternal mirror in the human heart. Truth, wisdom, God, reality. These are thrown within the heart of man. A man can reach them. Man can call upon himself for all that he needs and all that is necessary. And if he calls properly, he will be answered. Actually, there is no other answer to the problem of justice. If man is forever dependent upon something outside of himself for his survival, for his happiness, for his health, for his well-being, uh, then man must always be dependent upon vast patterns of circumstances over which he has no possible control. If man must depend upon the world for his happiness, he is also forced to accept that the world can be the cause of his misery. In the Indian and Chinese systems, this is simply not possible. No individual is required to be bound to a common pattern of error, simply because he has no way of escaping from error. Man is always capable of escaping from any condition of ignorance that afflicts him. The only thing is that he cannot find the answer in books. The individual seeking to escape from the restriction and limitation of the universe can escape from creation only by retiring into himself. Actually, if he goes deeply enough into himself, he finds the door which alone leads out of this maze into the security which we seek. All liberation must come from a motion inward, a motion toward cause, a motion toward root. And Yoga and Vedanta teach that the answer is for the individual to find once again his own root and to experience his relationship to universal life. Thus evolution carries these possibilities and man likewise possesses uh, these potentials within his own nature. Sometime he must evolve structures, instruments capable of sustaining this new degree of insight which will come to him. The uh, Hindus believe that there will be two more kinds of human beings. Uh, these two more kinds will represent, in a sense, two more races. Races beyond any that we know. The first two races of the earth, the race of the sun and moon, have vanished away. 
The others that we see around us belong to a pattern dear enough to our own kind uh, so that we recognize fraternity. What lies into the future? What kind of race can f come out of this one that will be different from it without taking on something of the uh, improbability of science fiction? The ancients were of the assumption that the next race would be obvious because the flesh of it, the substance of it, would be growing more and more attenuated. The body would be less dense and more sensitive. The nervous system would be infinitely more acute. Also, there would be a new pattern set up between the cerebrospinal and the autonomic nervous system. In some way, not too obvious, man would have two spinal cords representing an equilibrium of the complete nervous system. It was also very possible that in the course of this procedure his respiratory system would be markedly changed. That gradually uh, the distribution of energy through the air would give way to a distribution of energy through magnetic poles. That perhaps in a way man is anticipating these changes by the conditions that are arising in his society. Air and water pollution have increased. There seems to be no answer. This condition will go on and will enlarge and increase with populations with the continual growth of man's activities and his knowledge. Consequently, man must accustom or adjust himself to these changes, just as bacterial organisms can learn to survive the most powerful medications that we can turn against them. So man becomes less and less dependent upon the physical situations around him. Perhaps this also is the answer to the problem of population explosion. If the individual is no longer dependent for his nutrition or for a livelihood upon a balance of population, then the number of persons who exist within reason may not be nearly so important. As the individual develops, there must also be a corresponding enlargement of a psychomental receptivity. All evolution were leading to refinements, leading to attenuations and sensitivities, must be motions toward a greater insight into reality. This might have another very important effect upon, for instance, overpopulation in terms of employment. Uh, the future condition of man has to be built upon a greater insight than he has now. The systems that he now knows are failing. They represent a condition of living which has ceased to dominate in human affairs. Therefore, new relationships must arise among peoples, new codes of life, new concepts of success. And if, for example, for some reason, man should outgrow his peculiar fatal attachment to wealth, if he no longer would consider possession as status, it would not be long, perhaps, before his entire human society could be greatly altered. And if man outgrows this attitude of possession because his own consciousness is no longer adjusted to it, these changes will be painless. They will simply be the individual passing from an adolescent psychology to a more mature one by the inevitable natural processes of growth. Also, it is assumed that as this refinement continues, uh, there will be a larger and more active extrasensory band. That the individual will gradually uh, standardize uh, what might be termed extrasensory perception. 
uh, that uh, what we like to think of now as thought transference or clairvoyance may be a standard faculty. Not much more remarkable to the man of that day than sight is to us today. If such is the case, you can immediately realize the tremendous effect this will have upon the social and environmental life of man. If man really possesses a well-developed extrasensory perception, he will no longer be able to keep a secret. Nothing can happen without his knowing the facts of the matter. All promotion, all publicity, all propaganda will lose influence. The individual cannot and will not be deceived. He cannot be exploited. He cannot in any way be prevented from knowing the truth about how other people feel about him. Nor can he prevent other people from knowing how he feels about them. It might be a very astonishing thing if such frankness was thrust upon us. And yet, we can see how the extension of a single sensory perception could completely overwhelm the whole pattern of modern society, forcing it into an entirely different direction. If these all add together to produce what might be termed the sixth root race man, then we perceive an individual who in terms of our present capacities is extraordinarily learned. Uh, perhaps the best way that we can parallel this is in the Buddhist concept of the Arhat or in the Hindu concept of the Mahatma. This exceptional type of person, the illumined sage, the miracle worker, the wonder worker who achieves the incredible simply by obeying natural law, by permitting things to fulfill their own patterns without human interference. If such a race comes into existence, this in itself must be the solution to the problem of our dilemma. In other words, our answer lies in that man will outgrow himself, that his growth will go on. And this growth will probably be most rapid for those who already have begun the cultivation of these characteristics which belong to this type of growth. However we want to look at it, those grow most rapidly who deserve to grow who create within themselves the causes of their own improvement. We must naturally assume, therefore, that the same type of thing which has always happened is most likely to happen again. As surely as in the ancient legends, human beings uh, entered into and quickened the bodies of beasts to produce men. So another wave or level of consciousness in nature must take upon itself the vestments of the most advanced human types to produce the next general demarcation. Having established this demarcation, the Buddhists say these progenitors, these pioneers gradually retire permitting then the normal evolving groups for which they have prepared archetypal vehicles to take over and manage the new kingdom. In this sense then, the sixth race would represent beings, perhaps almost the perfect scientists. Scientists because error would be almost impossible to them. Science because they would have the common power to know, not to think, to hope, to speculate, to calculate. It would no longer be necessary for them to make an imaginary diagram of an atom because they could not see the real thing. 
It would not be necessary to go through the laborious process of Einsteinian calculations to discover the bases of the structure of matter and energy. These things would be known by the direct act of consciousness. And is it more remarkable that this could happen than that by an indirect act of consciousness, a scientist, mathematician, could create a formula which, when transformed into process, proves itself to be true on a very abstract level. What the modern electronic engineer is working with today is very close to a new dimension of human insight. But this new dimension has to have one other thing which is as yet deficient, and that is humanity. The gentle dedication of consciousness to the service of good. For without this transformation of vibratory core of man, the next step will not happen. Man can never be given a great step forward until and unless he is capable of using it wisely. So we must have to wait until man grows not only smarter, but better. For betterness is the key to insight. It is by improvement that man conquers himself. By skill he conquers other things, but remaining unconquered himself arrives at his own destruction. The next point then would be to consider the seventh, that which lies beyond the sixth great uh, racial demarcation. In this we have, as always in the Hindu septenaries upon which our present thinking is based, we always have the seventh as a kind of suspension. In the scriptures it is said that on the seventh day the Lord rested. If we swear the word Lord and make it law, on the seventh day the law rests. The law is suspended. The seventh day is consummation, culmination. The seventh step of Buddhism is nirvana, which is the complete suspension of everything. The seventh day of creation is absolute rest. Uh, this absolute rest, therefore, means in man the end of that which is not rest, namely restlessness. The seventh represents the final complete coordination of all the elements and instruments of the human f fabric. Uh, it is the actual culmination of unification. It is yoga, absolute union. It means that in this state there can be no longer any dissimilarity, inharmony, or conflict in the structure of man. There can be nothing working contrary to the rest. There can be no polarized opinion. There can no longer be any Aristotelian dichotomies. The individual, his consciousness and everything, transcends polarization or duality of any kind. It is then that being and not being cease, and reality alone remains. The nearest we can gain to the seventh state is that uh, of the conception uh, that the, the Tendai uh, Buddhists have of the nature of the Buddha Virakana. Virakana is in a sense the seventh race consciousness. It is uh, actually the complete suspension of every faculty, force, or power that in any way reflects limitation. It is the utterly unlimited. And the only thing that can be unlimited is that which no longer limits itself and therefore moves into total identity with reality. I think perhaps the uh, old Hindus came as near to the concept as anything uh, that we can imagine. Namely, the gradual retirement of man from objectivity. He will still have a body, 
but his body will be strangely attenuated, uh, like, la like that of the genie of the Chinese Taoist tradition. The body will be incidental to the person. He may use it if he wishes. If he does not wish it or does not need it, he does not have to use it. He gradually retires into a kind of luminous meditation in which the world around him is transformed also into the luminous manifestation of the divine power that creates it. When a being, luminous in all its parts, abides in a place which this being experiences inwardly as also all luminous, all light, all mystery, all glory, then we have probably the ground upon which the concept of paradise was devised, or the Edenic garden. So the sage, uh, the tenon, the mysterious magician master of the Taoist fables, is in a sense this final man that has lost all of its elementary powers or functions because it no longer needs them and retires more and more into the mysterious luminous atmosphere from which it came. Perhaps ultimately at the end of the race, the end of humanity, man dying out like sparks in space. Not because man dies, but from this perspective man dies. The sparks return to the flame. And that which we have experienced or known as humanity ceases. And the lower kingdoms growing up upon the earth take over the empty throne, creating new types of life, new orders of existence. But just as surely as the ancients believed that man came here out of a, an abode of light, came here, however, like a prodigal son, descending into embodiment for experience, descending as a sleeping soul into birth, uh, so truly in the end, fully awake, fully understanding the mystery of the life cycle through which it has passed and the reason for that cycle, the transcendent being returns again to the luminous sphere from which it came. Evolution goes on here. Perhaps someone with only a physical perspective would hardly notice the difference. The old forms go on, but new lives are moving through them. It is exactly as though we stood and watched a city day after day. In a hundred years, the streets would still be filled, but not one of the people would be the same. So in the world, the stream goes on. But who knows what strange chemistry takes place behind the masks of matter, the masks by which men think they recognize each other. But these masks are only a persona. And behind the mask is a face that may change. But we never notice the change because the mask does not reveal it. So all through nature, orders of life are changing. But we do not know this because they move through the forms which have been fashioned for their housing. The ancients likewise tried to consider how far man could go. What after all is man as we know him? He is a body, he is a consciousness, he is a being, he is something with a spark of life in his heart. Where is he going? How can we really guess where he is going? We know he came from less, and we know that he goes to more. But how much less did he come from, and how much more does he go to? In Hinduism and Buddhism, all life ultimately reunites itself with some form of an overlife. In Hinduism, it is Atman. Atman is the eternal soul. 
or eternal self. Buddhism, not recognizing Atman, posits is instead the complete suspension of all conditions in nirvana. But it clearly points out that nirvana is not total extinction. It is only the extinction of that which experiences separateness. So that beyond separateness is another kind of life that we do not fully appreciate right now. But the Atman, or the final over self, whether it be union in consciousness with the Buddha, whether it means the ultimate attainment of Buddhahood itself, which the Buddhist tradition affirms, or the Hindu Atman, or reunion with God, or oneness with the infinite. The concept is that what we call evolution has an over-pattern, a pattern larger than anything that we can appreciate. That these separate sparks which make all forms of life, from the tiny gnat floating in the sunbeam, from the electron and the atom, uh, from all the kingdoms of nature and even into the mysterious divine hierarchs described in the visions of saints, all of these sparks of light were cast from a single fire, one tremendous consciousness called Atman. This consciousness in the form of Vishnu floating upon the coils of the seven the coiled serpent of eternity on the ocean of space represents in strangely the total nature of life. At some time in the Hindu mythology, uh, this total life, this Brahma, this eternal Vishnu, this Lord Shiva, entered into the illusion of creation, becoming the great mendicant, adorning itself with ashes, wearing clay and sackcloth, the symbol of embodiment. And this one spiritual flame broke up into an infinite diversity of sparks. And each of these sparks became a living thing of some nature. And these sparks are infinite, as life is infinite. And these sparks are seed-like and, gem and germinal. And in this form, the great deity died. It was buried within creation itself, went to sleep in its own dream. In some of the Eastern fables it is said that this being entered into meditation, and in its meditation imagined itself to be embodied, and went through the processes of embodiment as an inner function of its own consciousness. And this inner function we know as creation. In any event, this supreme power became infinitely diversified through infinite time and infinite space. And then, in the processes of evolution, these forms which were built around the primordial sparks grew more and more adequate. The purpose of the growth of form was not that form should improve. The form grew only that the life within the form might have a nobler mansion. The whole problem of the unfoldment of form is merely that it is only in this way that life itself can become released from form. Evolution is an escaping of life from the inadequacy of form by creating better forms until finally freedom is achieved in the perfect form. When this freedom is achieved, the sparks do not simply go out into space and be, become dissipated. They do not fade away because they were never mortal. These sparks reunite, gradually assembling themselves into this mysterious abstract form which was their original. 
Uh, they move like a cloud of fireflies, back again to reassemble into the nature consciousness of being and being of Atman. And when the last of these little sparks has been freed from matter, Atman awakes from its sleep. At that moment, Atman is a free, is free. The God which created the world by entering into it and sustaining it with his own existence has been liberated. The evolution of man is the resurrection of God. Now, this is a daring thought, particularly coming from thousands of years ago. But it has influenced the philosophies and theologies of all peoples. It seems to give at least one somewhat adequate concept of what things might be like and why they are as they are. Actually, man is forever trying uh, to justify the universe to which he belongs. Some say this is superstition, that the only thing the individual wants to do is to have something to lean on that unless he evolves a theology or a psychology or a philosophy that has vast dimensions and proportions, he is afraid. He is afraid of being alone in the darkness of his own ignorance. This is, I think, a rather sophisticated point of view. A lot of it has gained momentum in the disillusionments following two world wars. But the fact still actually remains the disillusionment solves nothing. It brings no real answer. Disillusionment does not tell us why we're here. Usually disillusionment ends by taking away from us even the concept of the machinery that is necessary in order for us to be here at all. We cannot afford to take too much away because if we do, there is no one left to be disillusioned. We know, therefore, that there is a process operating. That the misfortunes, infirmities, and inconsistencies of life are actually the greatest proofs of natural law that there are. Rather than discounting natural law, they demonstrate it. And that there has to be some reason. We can have any reason you want, but it would be hard to imagine a more transcendent reason a more splendid vision than to realize that existence is an embodiment of universal life. That existence is alive because an infinite life inhabits it. That just as man's mind and consciousness have molded his body into its present proportions and dimensions, so infinite life has molded in space the infinite structure of the cosmos as being the least form capable of manifesting the cosmic purpose. This cosmic purpose, however, is not merely to remain glistening forever in the firmament. This cosmic purpose is not that suns shall go on circling forever around still greater cosmic centers. There has to be more than this infinite continuance of machinery. The time cycles are so vast that man cannot understand them. Any more than a tiny gnat in a sunbeam can ever understand the time cycles of man. Yet these cycles exist. And existence is always an, an infinite pattern of life becoming embodied passing through the processes of embodiment and finally passing out of embodiment and carrying with it in this great procession a parade, a processional of stars, of lives, of, of infinite sparks belonging to itself. And each of these sparks, an individualization of itself, now, when these sparks return to form itself again, and the Atman awakens from his mystic trance, what then? Is this the end of things? Is this the termination? 
The Hindus and the ancients did not believe in terminations. They believed in an infinite life, an infinite growth. They did not hold that it was possible for man to conceive of termination. All he could conceive of was things returning to their own natures and apparently ceasing in these natures. But then the composite nature into which they were, re they were returned, blossoming out again after the seven nights of the pralaya or infinite sleep. So life goes on, evolving, unfolding. But every experience that occurs in life has meaning. By our experience, we add to the waking of the sleeping Brahman. By the Brahman's experience in coming back to waking from its own sleeping, it adds wisdom to something beyond itself. Life goes on. Life is the infinite manifestation of growth. Now, men thought this way long before they were disillusioned. Perhaps they were right. Perhaps disillusionment is something that has simply numbed their senses uh, to a splendid vision that we all need. At least, I think, by the greatness of our vision, we gain a certain inspiration for the immediate regulation of conduct.